Our gospel reading this morning comes once again from Luke as we continue moving with Jesus and his disciples from Galilee to Jerusalem. Hear these words. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, Jesus said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then Jesus said to him, Get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. Please pray with me. Might words spoken and words heard and the spaces in between fill our hearts, our minds, our very selves with gratitude. Recently, I was out for a drive when I went by a tire store. Outside the doors were stacks and stacks of radials and white walls. And in front of the store, there was a sign, one of those signs with movable black letters. I couldn't help but chuckle as I drove by. It's back in season, read the black letters. Pumpkin Spice Rubber. (laughs) Ah, yes, the time of year when everything these days seems to be flavored or scented with pumpkin spice. I recently enjoyed a pumpkin spice muffin. I've seen pumpkin spice coffee, pumpkin spice air freshener, even pumpkin spice candles. I've even got some pumpkin spice oatmeal in my cupboard. All of it a sure sign that fall is here despite the weather and that Thanksgiving is just around the corner. Quite some time ago, at this very time of year, an article appeared in my then local newspaper headlined, Thanks to whom? The writer opened her piece by noting, something is missing from Thanksgiving. Can't be the turkeys, she noted. Their plucked hides have been everywhere. Pie ingredients have been plentiful. Canned pumpkin has been stacked to the grocery ceiling. The head count has been taken. Folded tables have been dusted off and good china hauled down. So what's missing from Thanksgiving? Then in the nerdy way that only one of us writers can get away with, she answers her own question. So what's missing? An indirect object, she writes. Now, Lest you think this was strictly an article about grammar, or that this is a sermon about the fine points of the English language, 
Let me quickly point out that she goes on to say the indirect object in question is God. For while there are admonitions aplenty at Thanksgiving time and other times of the year as well, for us to be thankful, rarely in public settings are we told to whom we are to give thanks. She recounts one example of this, an elementary school celebration of the holiday which she attended. All the children had been involved in decorating the tables in the cafeteria, you know, with miniature pumpkins and short little Puritans and all of that sort of stuff. The children were all dressed in their very finest. They had been instructed in proper etiquette. And in a few minutes, they were to be fed a delicious feast made up of the traditional Thanksgiving goodies, turkey and stuffing and gravy and mashed potatoes and, you know, all the other stuff you have to eat or your mother won't let you have pie. The principal stood to address the boys and girls, she writes. She affirmed what a special occasion this was. She complimented on how nicely they behaved. She reminded us all that we had been richly blessed. And then she said, why don't we all just take a moment and, uh, well, uh, uh, why don't we just take a, a moment and uh, be thankful? Now, obviously, a public school official is restricted in what he or she can say. She couldn't say, be thankful to God in that setting. But what about the rest of us? How often you hear folks like Oprah and Dr. Phil and Dr. Oz saying that we should always be thankful that we should be willing to have an attitude of gratitude. And I suppose on one level, just having a thankful approach, a grateful approach to life, has some real value. Certainly it's better than living out of a sense of entitlement. I have what I have because I deserve it. Yet still, I don't know about you, but I don't just sit around writing thank you notes and then put them in my desk drawer. No, I address them and stamp them and send them to whomever has been my benefactor. Our story this morning from Luke is about many things. The relationship between faith and healing, the treatment of outcasts by society, the nature of illness and its impact on life. But perhaps most importantly, this story from the gospel is about gratitude. There's much that could be said here about leprosy, much of which you've no doubt heard before if you've spent any time sitting in church pews. When it's mentioned in the Bible, it could be referring to a variety of different ailments. But generally, those ailments have in common some sort of disorder of the skin. It was believed in that time that leprosy was highly, highly contagious. And so lepers were forced to live in isolation from the rest of their community. Parents were literally separated for life from their children. Wives were separated from their husbands, friends from their friends. To touch a leper made one ritually impure. When lepers walked down the street, they were required, required by law, to call out, unclean, unclean, unclean to warn others that they were approaching so that they could get out of the way and not be touched or even run the risk 
of a casual brush. If a leper touched food, it was considered tainted and inedible by anyone else. If you found a piece of a leper's clothing, it had to be burned. And the rules went on and on and on. Jesus, in our story, is passing in between Galilee and Samaria. And you need to know there was a long and complicated history between the Samaritans and the Jews, but suffice it to say that there was great bitterness between them. They couldn't stand one another. But to get to Jerusalem from Galilee, one had two choices. Go the very long way around, or pass right through Samaria, which is what Jesus does. And as he and the disciples make their way along the road, they are approached by a group of lepers. Ten of them, we're told. Men, women, children, we don't know. The text doesn't say. But we do know that, that nine of them were Jews and one of them was a Samaritan even though they hated each other. Disease can make for rather strange bedfellows. Just ask anyone who spent time hanging out at an AIDS clinic. Just ask anyone who has sat in an infusion chair in a cancer treatment center. Apparently, these lepers have heard about Jesus and how he has been healing the sick, including other lepers. So they hope he might once again work his magic. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us, which he does. And in keeping with the law, he instructs them to go show themselves to the priests, for it is the priests who are empowered by that society to pronounce them healed, cured of their disease, clean and well, able to re-enter society. So off they run, delighted by this fortunate turn of events, no doubt anticipating the longed-for reunion with the husband she hadn't seen for decades the child who had grown up while he was away, the friend who lay at death's door, people they haven't been able to hug or touch for oh so many years. But, but they can only, only do that once the priests have declared them healed. So it's no wonder that they run practically tripping over one another. No wonder they're so eager to get to where they would ultimately be declared free. Free to go home. One, though, a Samaritan, remembers his benefactor and turns around and prostrates himself before the man of Nazareth. Thank you, Jesus, he cries out. Uh, not in the flip way. A friend of mine sometimes says those words when his football team scores a touchdown. Thank you, Jesus. But in a sincere and genuine way. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for giving me back my life. Thank you for giving me health and well-being. As he is there in front of him, Jesus scratches his head a bit, baffled that the others didn't come back. But then, perhaps with a shrug, he, he looks at the man and, and reaches down and takes him by the hand. He hasn't touched a clean hand in decades, that man on the ground. And he helps him to his feet. 
and he says to him, go your way, friend. Your faith has made you well. As one scholar notes, by Jesus' definition, faith and gratitude are closely related. And there is something life-giving about gratitude. The Samaritan knew who his benefactor was, acknowledged that by giving thanks, and as a result, was given an even fuller, richer life. One of my fellow graduates from the Shalem Institute of Spiritual Formation, Mary Clark, tells the lovely true story of Bonnie, a developmentally disabled adult in her early 30s. Bonnie was a very large and buxom woman with dark hair beginning to turn gray. She had, writes Mary, three great loves, flowers in her hair, white frilly blouses, and Jesus. As a small child, Bonnie had been told by her parents to get dressed one night. They were going to take her to a nice restaurant for dinner. But when they went out, they took an unexpected turn and, without warning, left Bonnie at an institution for the mentally challenged, never to see her again. Eventually, Bonnie was released to live in a group home which she liked very much. One summer, Bonnie had a job at the beach near her home, working in the bathhouse, distributing fresh, clean towels as women came in after a swim. It was not always an easy job, not always an easy place to work. And some of the people there made fun of her. Often, people called her names. Stupid, retard, dumb. They pointed at the plastic flowers she had so lovingly placed in her hair and laughed. But Bonnie stuck it out. And when she got her very first paycheck, Bonnie asked Mary to take her to the florist shop. There, she picked out a dozen red roses and many white carnations. It cost every single penny she had earned that first week. Then she asked Mary to take her to the church, where she placed the flowers on the altar, along with a note she dictated to Mary. Dear Jesus, it said, thank you for getting me this job. Love your friend, Bonnie. There was no question in Bonnie's mind who to thank. Like the Samaritan, she knew who her benefactor was, and she was more than willing to acknowledge it. For Jesus had made her life oh so much better in so, so many ways. Now I know. Many of us here, maybe even most of us here, really aren't used to or comfortable with using Jesus' language. But that shouldn't stop us from saying thank you, if not to Jesus by name, then to God 
That works just as well. For it is vital that we move through life with the same attitude and the same awareness of our benefactor as that Samaritan. Not in some vague manner, but like Bonnie, out of a deep sense of love and gratitude for the one, the one who gives life itself. Brothers and sisters, it's pumpkin spice time again. With all that special oatmeal, coffee, and rubber. And that means it'll soon be Thanksgiving. And in fact, for the Canadians in the crowd, it already is tomorrow is Thanksgiving. But we, we who know who our benefactor is, we should always remember to thank the Holy One for every gift we have been given. And not just on the second Monday in October or the fourth Thursday in November. We should remember to say thank you, Jesus, thank you, God, every single day 